Most of the nation and, of course, the SEC will have its eyes on Tuscaloosa on Saturday night, LSU, Alabama. Meanwhile, in the SEC Western Division elsewhere, another important one in Oxford, Texas A&M's in town to take on the Rebels. We got Carter Carls on the line from Gigum 247 Sports to help us break it down. Carter, how you doing today? Good, man. Uh, headed to Oxford tomorrow, so uh, excited for a uh... Another road trip and should be a fun game. I just glanced at the SEC Western Division standings. It is what I knew it to be, just uh, double checking in regards to wins and losses and trying to find a path for Texas A&M to win this thing. And there doesn't appear to be one that's that's realistic. Of course, Alabama hasn't lost a game, so that one score loss at Kyle Field could prove decisive. Now, if Texas A&M wins out, they're going to rack up, of course, key wins against Ole Miss and LSU, but LSU needs to take down Bama, and then somebody else needs to take down Bama to create some kind of a mess in the SEC West. Uh, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, I guess uh, maybe the best case would be maybe a, a four-way tie with uh, Ole Miss, LSU, and Bama. Uh, maybe if Bama has two losses, LSU, Ole Miss, and a and Maybe, but I think even then, A and M would have to. I'm trying to remember if the tiebreaker is either record among those four teams, or if it is where you finish in the college football playoff standings that decides the SEC West. I don't know. For, once you get the four game four way <laughs> tiebreaker, that, that's where it uh, gets very very confusing for people who aren't great at math like me. Yeah, I've got to say, I've been weeding through the big 10 west and the big 10 east and the acc and i've done about three or four of these this week in regards to tiebreakers and tiebreaker rules six and seven deep i have yet to dive into the sec west but i'm sure it's something close to uh those uh factors but uh there's a lot of work to be uh, accomplished and, and a lot of breaks that would have to to play so basically texas a&m's that they're, they're basically out of it at this point uh, in terms of winning the division championship, uh, this team lost a couple of consecutive games against uh, Alabama and Tennessee, and then they bounced back with a win against South Carolina. Hard fought win, had control of the game, but still uh, didn't exactly uh, dominate this game. Uh, just your thoughts about the Aggies performance at this point uh, compared to the expectation. Yeah, I mean, um, I think people were skeptical going into the year about this team. No one was pr really predicting them to win the SEC or anything. Um, so for some people, this is about what they expected. I, I think what has been disappointing is ever since the season started, we we've started to understand, hey, this is pretty much a wide open SEC West. There there's not one team that's just this super dominant, like going to win every game. Uh, that you traditionally have. And so he's thinking, man, if, if, if they just uh, win against Alabama, they could have a chance to, to make the SC West. But they, they just couldn't quite uh, make enough plays in those games against Alabama and Tennessee. Uh, Miami, that's a totally different game that was just pretty disastrous for A&M. But Bama and Tennessee, I thought, were pretty winnable for this team. And their offense just failed them uh, in their second half woes. Their last four games combined in the second half, they've only scored 18 points, uh, six field goals. So they have not scored a touchdown in the second half of their last four games. That's been really the problem for this team recently has been their offense. Um, this team certainly has had a lot of great moments this season. I mean, they look phenomenal uh, against uh, Auburn in the second half. Uh, Arkansas, they had some dominant stretches. Um, South Carolina, they, they had that second quarter where they put up 21 points. But a four-quarter game has not really been what this team has been about all season, and it's kind of what has held them back the most. Carter, when you throw out that stat of six field goals, no touchdowns in four games, in key SEC games that obviously would either – wreck the season or put them in a position to win a championship. And it's obviously by losing two straight has uh, taken them basically out of contention. Uh, 
that takes us back to the biggest news in the off season, which was Bobby Petrino taking over the offense. So of course the quarterback was lost and Connor Wigman, who in going back to the Miami game, I was utterly impressed with his ability to stand in there against a fierce pass rush and make plays and put it up like 53 times and still have to carry an offense with lack of a running game to support him. Uh, but they lose the five star and Max Johnson I'm also impressed with Max Johnson. I've been a Max Johnson fan because that guy will stand in a pocket and uh, you know, doesn't matter how many hands in his face and helmets in his ribs, and he'll stand in there and deliver some some tight window throws. Uh, but no s- touchdowns in four games, That uh, that's an alarming stat. So how do you think Petrino's worked out? Well, Petrino, it's funny because, like, you have to almost grade him on a scale in a sense, because with, with him, uh, he can't do magic, right? Like he can't, he can't fully fix an offensive line that was kind of doomed from the start. He, he can't quite make up losing his starting quarterback and, and the drop off that's there between Wigman and Johnson. So I, I kind of give him a break because like, man, I don't know how many offensive coordinators could, could thrive in these circumstances. Um, but he, he hasn't been amazing, right? He hasn't been, you know, just the answer that they needed. So uh, definitely can't give him a lot of praise either. So he's kind of in this in-between where, you know, you'd like to see what he'd look like with a full offense. He certainly has a, a great reputation as far as being an offensive mind and play caller. So it, it's hard to, to, to just say, man, he's fully lost it or anything like that. But uh, biggest problem for this offense, I mean, Max Johnson, I, I like the quarterback. I think he's he was one of the best backup quarterbacks uh, in the country entering the season. Uh, there is a drop-off there between him and Wigman, but, but the biggest thing is the offensive line. They have not protected the quarterback. They have not created holes in the running game. Until the South Carolina game, they had been very poor in short yardage situations. So pretty much every miserable way, they've been quite awful, to be honest. Uh, they got a true freshman starting at right tackle in Chase Pisanis, who was recruited to play offensive guard. Uh, they just really lack a lot of quality players and a lot of depth uh, on the offensive line. So um, that's been the hard thing. And when you can't protect the quarterback, when you leave the nation and, and quarterback hits surrendered, um, Hard, hard, hard to have success. Doesn't matter how many great players you have. When, I mean, if you you watch these last few games, Max Johnson, and I, I don't know how he's been healthy coming out of them because he has been hit a lot over the last few games. And that brings me to a conclusion that's difficult to figure out uh, based on, okay, the recruiting's been insane. Top five classes, top 10 classes all over the place. And obviously the one historic class I think it's been overplayed in regards to how many defections there have been from those classes. It's not anything alarming compared to what everyone else is experiencing in the transfer portal. So when you recruit that kind of talent and we know that it's been, it's been maybe leaning defense, but certainly there's not been a shortage of talent recruited and signed on the offensive side and along the offensive line. And they've, they've churned out some excellent offensive linemen, of course, under Jimbo Fisher that uh, it's difficult for me to surmise what's what's going wrong here unless there's just been some chaotic rash of injuries because uh, the, the talent's been recruited and signed. Has it not been developed? I mean, I think the biggest issues when you look at even Jimbo Fisher's end at Florida State, it's been offense, it's been offensive line, and it's been quarterback. And even receiver to an extent. Uh, throw some numbers at you. Receiver, they've had since Jimbo Fisher's been a head coach, he has had two wide receivers drafted in the NFL. Only two. He's been a head coach for 13, 14 seasons. Uh, only two. And they've had some pretty good ones, but to have only two is, is pretty stunning. And all of them were at Florida State. So he's had no receiver drafted to AM. I think that will change with these guys coming up, but that's, that's still quite alarming. A uh, quarterback. I mean, 
there is a long list of either bad evaluations, bad development, bad, bad just quarterbacks that he's had since post Jameis Winston. Um, and he's also had some bad luck at the quarterback position. Uh, at A&M, last three seasons, if you include this season, uh, he has lost four starting quarterbacks. He lost uh, Haynes King in the 2021 and 2022 seasons. He lost Max Johnson last season. Uh, and he lost uh, Connor Wigman this season. So that's four in three years. And, you know, I don't care how great your team is, if you're constantly playing with a backup quarterback, it's going to be very hard to succeed. Um, and then you couple that with the fact that this has been a pretty off, pretty bad offensive line for back-to-back -back years. Um, they just haven't quite recruited uh, offensive tackles and developed them very well. Um, that's probably the, the biggest concern for me. They've had some decent guards. They've, you know, Bryce Foster – started his career pretty well. He's, he's kind of regressed, but offensive tackles the position where it's like, man, but it, it's just wild to think about that because in 2020, they had a top three offensive line in the country um, and they had a great offensive line coach. And then he you know, left for USC and uh, all those offensive linemen left. And um, then starting in 2022, you know, you're starting with somewhat of a new group and a new offensive line coach and Steve Adazio. It just just hasn't gelled the way you've wanted it to. So quarterback, O-line, to a certain extent receiver. You could say scheme and stuff like that too, but uh, and some bad luck as well. Please subscribe to our SEC channel. You might be watching this on our SEC channel. There you go. You just subscribe right here, or you might be watching this video on the main channel. Just look up the SEC channel. The link's in the description section of every video to, to lock in on what we're doing there. Head on over to Gigum 247 and check out Carter's work at uh, Gigum 247 Sports. I'm going to stay on this path uh, before we get to the Ole Miss game, since we've already started uh down this path. So I'm not going to ask you about the Texas A&M fan base because fan bases are all over the place in regards to the reasonable and the delusional and everything in between. Uh, I know fan bases whose teams go 11 and one and they still want their coach fired. So I'm not going to ask about that, but in terms of uh, folks like yourself uh, that, that are reasonable, understand the landscape, but still have high expectations for a coach that's making as much money as anybody in the country. And it was brought in seven years ago and has basically run an eight and four program. You know, what, where is that dividing line of, okay, uh, we're going to put the excuses at or reasons uh, to the side and weed through those and then evaluate where this program stands versus where it should be. And then the money involved, of course, has been a big thing about the contract buyout. But of course, the deep pockets are in place as well. Uh, you know, at what point is the seat going to get hot to 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 make a move? Oh, it's hot, but uh, it's making a move requires a lot of different factors other than just paying a buyout. I mean, you're talking about not just a seventy six point eight million dollar buyout, but who do you get that's better? Who do you get that's affordable, right? Like if you're spending $76.8 million, can you afford a good coach? And then if you do get a good coach, can you keep all your players? I think that's probably the biggest concern A&M fans have now is they say, this is one of the most talented teams, at least from a recruiting ranking perspective, one of the more talented teams they've had ever. and you risk losing that if you fire your coach. You risk losing, you know, an Edger and Cooper or an Evan Stewart. You know, those, those kind of just really amazing impact players. Um, now, we've seen coaches that have come in, you know, Josh Heifel and uh, Mike Elko and uh, even Dion to an extent kind of go into a program and almost immediately breathe life into it from the transfer portal. But – I think a &M just has so much homegrown talent that you're, you're just kind of, you, you live in fear of potentially losing them. And so there's this balance of, well, 
if you fire the guy, you might lose all those players. But if you don't fire them, they may leave anyway. And it may, you know, maybe time to rip the Band-Aid off. It may be time to say, hey, Texas and OU are, are joining the SEC and they're on the rise while A&M is on the decline. And so you got to kind of fix that up. You got to kind of find a new answer uh, before you're sitting there next season losing to Texas and thinking, my gosh, how did we get here? Uh, because that's the unfortunate thing. A&M, over the last decade, you thought had built some momentum over Texas. They, they had the Johnny Manziel craze. They, they had the 2020 season. They had the number one recruiting class while Texas was going through coach after coach. And now here they are potentially, you know, winning the Big 12, maybe maybe have, knocking on the door of the playoff. And I think that's stuff that A&M considers. They say, you know, Texas and A&M have never been good at the same time. And so the fact that one is better, that, that kind of drives things. You've seen A&M fire coaches because of Texas. You've seen Texas fire coaches because of A&M. So that's also on A&M's mind uh, as well. So there's kind of this balancing act of like trying to predict the future of like, well, if we do this, then this might happen. Uh, but if we don't do this, this might happen. So it, it's got everybody in a kind of a pretzel right now. And I kind of understand both sides of it. But uh, these last four games could dictate how it all plays out. You know, if, if they come out and, beat Ole Miss or LSU, and they look improved coming out of this bye week uh, from a couple weeks ago and, and win four of the last five games, then, hey, maybe that changes some, some, some thoughts in College Station. It won't permanently change it, but maybe you could feel a little bit better. So I think these last five games, uh, last four now, could be big for, for the Aggies. Yeah, it, it could be. They've got the opportunity. They're playing – the other two best teams in the division outside of Alabama uh, straight in front of them. So they've got something that they can prove. And even if that is not enough to win the West, which most likely it wouldn't be, I think that that would uh, be a huge step in the, in the right direction. However, when you look at uh, five and three and three and two, that just looks like that could have been slotted any year uh, under Jimbo Fisher outside of 2020. Uh, and then looking at yeah. the way they've played, and then who's in front, you figure, um, oh, maybe they beat Ole Miss, maybe they beat LSU. The likelihood of them beating both based on what they've done against ranked teams under Jimbo Fisher is fairly small. And then there's, uh, I don't know who else they've got off the top of my head. They've already played Arkansas. Who's the other SEC game that they would have left? They got Mississippi State and Abilene Christian. Oh, Mississippi State, they've yet to play. Okay. And that hasn't been a give me uh, by any stretch. So, yeah, it's a fascinating topic uh, for college football fans to look at uh, a place with just stockpiled in resources and the fan base is rabid. There's no lack of support, that's for sure. And everything that they've got going for them and it hasn't uh, completely turned around, nor did it need to completely turn around because Kevin Sumlin was churning out pretty much the same level of season. Uh, while he was there. Uh, we got Carter Carls on the line from Giggum 247 Sports. So this Ole Miss game is coming up. Lane Kiffin uh, has had his words in the past about Texas A&M football. Uh, that just came to mind. But uh, he's uh, uh, one of the best uh, offensive minds in the game. Uh, Going to be a difficult assignment. Uh, Edger and Cooper is playing out of his mind. I see that. And uh, this Texas A&M defensive line is one of the best in the SEC, if not the nation as well. And uh, your thoughts about this matchup against Ole Miss? Yeah, two teams that still, to me, have something to prove. I mean, I, I think Ole Miss has done a lot more than A&M this season. But uh, when you take a closer look at them, I think what's interesting is, and A&M too, they have both beat up on bad teams. And then when they played good teams, there have been – certain things that have been worrisome. Like Ole Miss, the one really good offense they played in LSU took them to task. The one really good defense they played in Alabama held them to 10 points. You could look and say the same thing about A&M. The two really good passing attacks they played, Miami and Alabama, threw it all over them. 
the one really good running attack they played at Tennessee ran it down their throat. And so, you know, I think there's some of these statistics that can kind of trick you where it's like, well, they got seven sacks against Auburn. Does that mean that they've got the best, you know, whatever in the country? Now, I do still think these teams are very legit. Um, I just am very curious to see how those kind of match up because I think A&M right now, they're 13th in run defense. Um, but the, like I said, the one good rushing attack they played, they struggled. So can they hold up against Quinshawn Judkins and company? They didn't last season. They really struggled to, to uh, contain him last season. So can they be improved in that area? Um, same thing with the, the passing attack. I mean, Ole Miss can throw it down the field. Uh, Jackson Dart, you know, can make plays with his legs. So this defense will have a, a tall task for him. Uh, offensively, you know, A&M has really struggled in that area, but they, they started to show improvement last game. I know it was South Carolina, but, you know, they're, they're starting to find Anaya Smith more. They're starting to kind of realize what their strengths are. They figured out short yardage situations a little bit. So can they continue to improve in that area is kind of the question with them. Uh, but a and overall, eight straight road games they've lost, dating back to the 2021 20, season. And with Jimbo Fisher, he has not beaten a ranked team on the road since 2016, which is uh, kind of wild to think about. But uh, so a and is going to have to do something it hasn't done in a while. Jimbo Fisher's going to have to do something he hasn't done in a while. And so that's why I kind of have some skepticism going into this game with the Aggies. Carter, you did a great job of addressing the the buyout. I knew it was something in that range of $75 million when you bring up those numbers. And again, I also made the comment a few minutes ago because I've looked them up in the past, have not done it recently, that the numbers are minuscule against uh, ranked teams overall, but especially on the road, as you mentioned. And then obviously, like with any team, the, the further you go up the rankings, the more difficult and the lower the winning percentage. But when I see Auburn buying out two contracts in the span of three or four years that don't total anything close to that, but there's still two contracts that have put them behind 30, 35 million, something in that range. And if there was a level playing field in regards to resources, I'd say, well, 75 is out of range, but considering uh, the deep pockets in Texas or what is reported to be, uh, that's why I, I tend to go in that direction. And then also thinking that a coach may, because we see this from time to time, may be willing to take a percentage of that. Here's 50 million and uh, we'll be on our way. And, and I know it's not that easy, but uh, again, a seventh season with Jimbo Fisher and staring at another seven and five, eight and four is just, uh, I got to think next year is going to be <laughs> the final yeah. run. Yeah, it's so interesting looking at next year because, first of all, let me let me preface this by saying this team and this coach have done nothing to give me any hope or any optimism to think that they'll turn it around uh, long term, at least. It's just there's too many problems there. There's too much underachievement. I totally agree with you. Next year, though, you look at it. They don't play Bama or Georgia, which I think is a huge plus. Their three biggest games are all at home, Notre Dame, Texas, and LSU. And then you have the 12-team playoff. And so I think they're, the reason why this fan base, the reason why Jimbo Fisher is not fired yet is because they look at, hey, if we bring all this talent back and we can figure it out in this last half of the season, and maybe you make a couple moves in the transfer portal to improve the O-line, Maybe you make some personnel changes to kind of improve things. Maybe this is a team that's good enough to, in a season where you don't play Bama or Georgia, get to 10 and 2 or 11 and 1 and, and crack that playoff. Now, if they don't do that next season, or if they lose to Texas, especially, yeah, it's, you're not coming back from that. There's no chance. But I think right now there's still that lingering optimism of maybe, just maybe, you stick around one more year. Now, 
there's still so much pessimism here. I just think it's too much of a fracture of some people think this, some people think that to kind of come together and, and rally kind of like they did with Kevin Sumlin after they lost to UCLA in 2017. Uh, I mean, that was like that, that loss to UCLA was so devastating for this program that it brought everybody together. A&M hasn't quite had that moment yet to, to make that decision. You lose to Mississippi State and you lose to LSU by 40 and or something like that. Maybe that happens, but I, I just I feel like it, it would maybe need to take a disaster for everyone to come together like that. And just so our non-Texas A&M fans who may not remember, Carter is referring to a date at the Rose Bowl to open the 2017 season and a 34-point lead that was blown. Historic comeback by UCLA, 45-44. Yeah. Uh, and, and you bring up the 12-team playoff, and I think that's enormous in this because no longer will coaches be judged on, well, you got to win a conference championship to get to the playoff unless you're on the rare occasion, Alabama or Ohio State, that gets selected. But basically, you have to win – the conference, the toughest conference in America, typically, maybe not this year, but it has been for 15 years to get to a playoff. But now I don't think coaches are going to be judged on winning conference championships anymore. It's going to be about how many times did you get to the playoff and you got a 12 team playoff. You go 10 and two in the SEC. You are in the playoff. You go nine and three with the schedule that you just outlined with Notre Dame uh, on the non-conference. You might get to the playoff. Uh, in the SEC. So that's going to be the new standard. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it, it gives you hope, right? Like it, even if you're a small school, small school too, if you're a Tulane or Air Force, it gives you hope. So I, I really think that it's going to be interesting. This Ole Miss team could be making the playoff a couple of years. Uh, I think if you look at the last few years, they would have made it a, one or two times. So uh, it's freaking hard to win the SEC. It is just a bloodbath every year. Getting to 10 and two alone feels like a miracle if you're not Bama or Georgia, or maybe even LSU. So uh, being able to be in the playoff, even though you lose your tough games. I mean, I remember the 2020 season, A&M coming out of COVID, one of their first games, it was their second game of the season, and, and they weren't what they were at the end of that season whatsoever. They they came out against Vanderbilt and, and almost lost the game. Then they come against Bama, and they made it pretty competitive in the first half, and then it, they kind of blew the doors off them in the second half. And they were completely judged on that game by the end of the season. It was like, ah, oh, they got killed by Bama. Don't let them in. Yeah, they won every other game by double digits. And you know, besides the Florida game, you know, they beat Florida. Then they won all the other games by double digits. Doesn't matter. They lost that game. Now you're not going to be held to that standard. Now it's going to be, oh, you're 10 and 2. You're in. So uh, I think that's going to be a breath of fresh air for these SEC West coaches. Carter Carls at uh, Gigum 247. Join him right there. Get uh, prepped for the Ole Miss game, recruiting and everything else going on. And uh, I see a top 10 recruiting class. So things seem to be pretty much in order with what they've been. Are there any key leans or targets or anything on the front page of the recruiting watch for the next few weeks? Yeah, I know. I know Cam Coleman was kind of their big catch, uh, five-star receiver out of Alabama, kind of took him out of Auburn's backyard. I know they, they really wanted him. And he's someone that they uh, want to hold on to. Terry Bussey, safety, that's obviously another highly rated guy. Uh, they did lose an offensive tackle recently to Weston Davis. That was brutal. Uh, I mentioned offensive tackles, kind of the position that they uh, – have really been needing to recruit well. So uh, can they fix that? Can they fix that through the transfer portal? Will be something to watch. Uh, Draylon Miller also decommitted. Uh, he was at the game this past Saturday. So um, A&M's hoping to get back in his good graces as far as uh, committing back to him. But uh, yeah, this, this the, the Sharks are kind of circling around A&M on a recruiting 
uh, from a recruiting perspective where you've seen a couple of decommitments in the last couple of weeks at full strength. This could be a top, top five, top 10 class, but with the way things are trending, if A&M doesn't get things figured out, they may lose a couple more guys. And so uh, not what you want to see. They can still get it back on track though. They get a win this Saturday. I think though a lot of their problems will go away, at least in the short term. So good class, but a little scary right now. Folks, please like the video. If you enjoyed the content, subscribe to our SEC channel and uh, get on over to Gigum 247 and check out what Carter's got available there. Uh, Carter, we appreciate you stopping by. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you having me.